Welcome to Introduction to Inpatient Compliant Queries. I'm Mrs. J. I'm the Curriculum Director at AMCI, and I also have a guest, Ms. Virginia. She is our, well, let's say she does a lot of things, and she is the voice of AMCI. We're going to hear from her shortly. Now, let's begin with a question. <laughs> a question about a question. What is a query? Well, AAPC and others say that queries are utilized to support the ability to accurately assign a code and can be initiated by either the coding or clinical documentation improvements professionals. Now, I say a query is to ask a question. That's pretty much it. A query is to ask a question. When there is provider documentation dis discrepancies, we will have to query. Simple as that. Now, what do we query? We query if there's a problem with legibility, completeness, documentation clarity, consistency, precision, reliability, and timeliness. Yes, so the documentation must be as perfect as we can get it, and query is the tool that we use, all right? Now, why do we query? We query because I did say it had to be perfect, and it has to be perfect because we need the documentation to be supported. So the documentation of a diagnosis has to be supported. That documentation has to support the diagnosis. We, we query to resolve conflicting diagnoses. We query to clarify the reason for admission, to clarify documentation not clinically supported, to establish a diagnostic cause and effect relationship between medical conditions. We query to establish the acuity or specificity of a documented diagnosis, to establish the relevance of a condition documented as history of, to support appropriate present on admission indicator assignments to clarify if a diagnosis is ruled in or out, and finally, to clarify the objective and the extent of a procedure. Now, this is where we're going to have a little bit of instruction. We're going to go through each of these reasons or uh, of why to query, and we'll begin with reason one. When we say to support documentation of a diagnosis. When you have a discharge summary and an assessment, let's say in the discharge summary, it says the patient arrives with complaints of edema, blood pressure was 120, excuse me, 190 over 20, antihypertensive medication was administered, patient has no prior cardiac history, patient was admitted for hypertensive crisis, assessment, hypertensive crisis, and CHF. Hmm. Well, the discharge summary doesn't mention anything about CHS, and if nothing else in that patient's chart mentions that the patient had congestive heart failure, then you may want to query the physician for clinical documentation to support the diagnosis. So this is an example of reason one, to support the documentation of diagnoses. All right, number two, we query to resolve conflicting diagnoses. In our example, we have a progress note. On March 30th, Dr. A documents COPD as the patient's diagnosis. On the 31st, Dr. B says this patient has respiratory failure. And on the 1st, Dr. C says the patient has asthma. Now, 
this is conflicting because we have multiple health care providers providing different diagnoses. However, they probably are talking about the same thing. So the coder or the CDI professional will need to query the physician to determine the correct diagnosis. Which one? All right. This is your example of number two. Let's move on to number three. We query to clarify the reason for admission. In our example, it says the history of present illness, patient complains of foot pain, patient was admitted for workup and treatment, final diagnoses, gout and diabetic neuropathy. All right, so both are chronic illnesses and if one led to the admission, the reason for the admission we'll need to know we can't determine based upon this doc, um, documentation. So the coder or the CDI professional will need to query to determine which diagnosis led to the admission. Now, why would we need to know which one led to admission? If you said, because that's going to be the principal diagnosis, outstanding. All right, reason number four, to clarify documentation not clinically supported. In our example, the history of present illness, the patient is admitted for chest pain. On day one, the progress note says, the patient was treated with nitroglycerin. Day two, progress note says, the patient had an ECG and an MRA, and then the discharge summary says acute myocardial infarction. Hmm. Hmm. Nowhere in this documentation or in the chart supports that an AMI took place. There are some small indicators that an AMI took place or heart attack, but these indicators are also pertinent to coronary artery disease with angina, right? So there's nothing in there that says this patient had a heart attack. So the coder or CDI professional will need to query the physician to determine if the patient actually had a heart attack because the documentation does not fully support a heart attack. Now I'm going to take a little pause for a moment to say I'm going to address what some of you may be thinking at this point. So you might say, hey, I am not there yet. I'm not a clinical documentation specialist. I'm not even clinically versed. How am I to know that these indicators are not quite pertinent for a, a, an acute myocardial infarction? Well, I'm going to show you very soon, okay? And this is an excellent tool, so definitely stay tuned. All right, let's move on to reason number five, to establish a diagnostic cause and effect relationship between medical conditions. In our example, it says discharge summary, patient diagnoses, hypertension, and CKD due to unknown causes. Wow. So if you are a student of ICD-10-CM, you know anytime hypertension and CKD are documented, you can go, a go ahead and link the two diagnoses. But in our case, it says the CKD is due to some unknown causes. So we can't link them. The doctor said it's due to some unknown causes. So the coder or CDI professional will need to query the physician to determine what those unknown causes are because we want to go ahead and code to the highest level of specificity. And if we can code hypertensive kidney disease versus hypertension, 
we want to do it. All right, let's move on to reason six to establish the acuity or specificity of a documented diagnosis. In our example, the history of present illness says, diabetic patient complains of pain in feet. The exam, patient has numbness with reduced sensation of touch, uncomfortable tingling and burning in both feet. Final diagnosis, diabetes. All right, so these clinical indicators look like the patient may have been worked up for diabetic neuropathy and maybe the provider forgot to write it, okay? And diabetes is not as specific as it could be. If we could document diabetic neuropathy, that is much more specific and that's what we strive towards. So the coder or CDI professional will need to query the physician to determine if there is possibility that the diagnosis of diabetes can be further specified. All right, we're coming down to the wire. Reason seven, to establish the relevance of a condition documented as history of. The, in our example, the history of present illness says, the patient was admitted for anemia due to chemotherapy. However, in the discharge summary, the document says that the patient has a history of breast cancer. Now, if we know our guidelines, we know that in order to code something as history of, that disease or illness must be completely eradicated. And if it's completely eradicated, if cancer in this case was completely eradicated, why is this patient having chemotherapy? So, this coder or CDI professional will need to query the physician to determine if the patient has cancer or not. That makes sense, right? All right, reason number eight, to support an appropriate present on admission indicator assignment. All right, so if you have a circumstance where the operative note says that the patient had a gastric bypass and liver laceration was repaired. Oh boy. So we're gonna need to know if that liver laceration was present on admission. Why do we need to know if that liver laceration was present on admission? Because if it was present, well, I'm gonna say it this way. If it was not present on admission, then we have a problem. That means that an incident or accident occurred during surgery. So we're gonna to need to contact that physician, query that physician to ask them if the liver laceration was POA. And if it's not, then the bottom line is most insurance companies are not gonna pay. The hospital will have to pay for that one. Reason number nine, to clarify if a diagnosis is ruled in or out. Yes. All right, so in our example, we have progress note, perfusion therapy, operative note, cabbage times three, endoscopic harvest of saphenous vein, discharge diagnosis, rule out, AMI. All right, so although the coder can code this as AMI because um, guidelines say that you can, when, it's, when you're inpatient, you can code rule out as, as if it happened. You can do that. However, we need to make sure that this note is accurate. You can't have something like this blatantly inaccurate without addressing it. So we, this 
indeed looks like that this patient has or had an AMI, and you're still probably saying, Mrs. J, how do you know? I'm going to show you how I know. Be patient, all right? Okay, so we need to know if we can go ahead Ahead and confirm that this patient did have an AMI, the doctor will need to correct his documentation and we're going to query. And um, that's what we're going to do. The coder will need to query to determine if the patient actually had this um, acute myocardial infarction. Common treatments for AMI are cabbage and reperfusion therapy. They're not going to do those things, well, reperfusion therapy, especially if a patient is not infar having infarction. So um, we just want to know. All right. Finally, reason 10 to clarify the objective and extent of a procedure. I like this example. We have an operative report. Patient had a previous laparoscopic hysterectomy resulting in endometrial tissue lodged into the abdominal wall. Abdominoplasty was carried out. Endometrium was removed from, from the abdominal wall. Final diagnosis, endometriosis. So if you really know what's going on here, this patient had a tummy tuck. Yes, but is a tummy tuck justifiable for endometrial removal from the wall? It looks like maybe they could have had a, a lesser um, invasive way to carry out that procedure. So the, the coder or the CDI professional will need to query that physician to determine what was the objective of the abdominoplasty. If that provider comes back and says the objective of that abdominoplasty was to remove the endometrial tissue, then you have to code it like that. But the doctor will more than likely say that the objective of the abdominoplasty was the tummy tuck. And why do we need to know about these objectives of a procedure? If you haven't studied PCS coding, PCS coding is, these codes are highly granular, highly specific, and these codes really are developed around the objective of the procedure. Yeah, so it's a little different. It's not like coding regular procedures. So in inpatient coding, not to get too far off, we code for the resources used while inpatient. The resources, not the actual um, surgery, but the resources for that surgery and the objective also substantiates using those resources. All right, so I got off track a little bit, but a lot of you, if you're studying inpatient, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so now that we know what we should be querying, let's talk about how it should be done. It is quite simple. Qu queries must be clear and concise. Queries must contain clinical indicators from the health record. When you query, present only the facts to identify why the clarification is required. Queries must be compliant. And finally, never in your query should you discuss the impact on the re reimbursement. Now, I did say that we strive towards specificity, and I'm going to say it. The more specific a diagnosis is, the higher the reimbursement. That is true, but that is not what we should tell the provider. That should not be their reason for adjusting the documentation. All right, so there are types of queries. There are three types of queries. You have an open-ended query, 
you have a yes or no, and that's also a closed-ended query. And you have a multiple choice query, these three types. And an example of an open-ended query is, can you further explain? Open-ended queries allows the provider to speak freely. Whereas a closed end of query, an example is, was this injury present on admission? Yes or no? That's it. So it's closed ended. The provider can't simply speak freely. They have to just say yes or no. All right. And finally, multiple choice is what we know it as. And here's an example. Can the diagnosis be further specified to one of the following? A chronic, B, acute, C, acute and or chronic. So multiple choice questions gives the provider an opportunity to select from the options. Now, I'm ready to show you how I know, how I have all this clinical knowledge. Yes, it is the AHIMA toolkit. And yes, you must be a member of AHIMA to use this resource. So if you're studying for your inpatient exams, if you're studying for the CCS, definitely become a member so that you can get this free resource. Also, they have an outpatient toolkit. So the inpatient toolkit, the outpatient toolkit, they are, it's gold. That's all, it's simply gold. All right, so I'm just going to show you, we're gonna utilize the inpatient query toolkit and I will give you a, I don't know, I just kind of show you it by also um, having or demonstrating an exercise. So we'll kill two birds with one stone, all right? So I'm going to ask Miss Virginia to come to the fore to read this scenario. Are you ready, Miss Virginia? Yes, I am. All right, Miss Virginia, take it away. Patient with a history of CHF was admitted with complaints of severe edema, ascites, dyspnea, jugular vein distension, and productive chronic cough of pink frothy mucus. Patient is obese with a history of HTN and obstructive sleep apnea. ECG revealed reduced ejection fraction, BNP, lipids, and C-reactive proteins were abnormal. Oral androtensin converting enzyme or ACE inhibitor, adictone administered every four hours along with metoprolol. IV LASIK significantly, significantly alleviated the edemia. Assessment CHF. Plan, continue course. Patient referred to cardiac thor thoracic surgery. Thank you, Ms. Virginia. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> is there a query opportunity? Thank you so much, Ms. Virginia. She doesn't usually read for us, but this is a pleasure for me. All right, okay. so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my AHIMA inpatient query toolkit. All right, I'm gonna go to my toolkit. I'm going to search in the table of contents, my chapter, my pertinent chapter. So in this case, we have a um, circulatory um, disease, congestive heart failure. So I'm going to go to that section. They're pretty much consistent with ICD-10 CM chapters. So chapter nine, diseases of the circulatory system. Underneath, there are three conditions, congestive heart failure, specificity, AFib, and myocardial infarction. So in our circumstance, we have CHF, right? Our patient was diagnosed with CHF, so you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna click on this link. And why am I gonna click on this link? I'm gonna click on this link because I need to know if I need to query. How am I gonna know? I'm gonna click on this link. This link is so amazing because it helps you 
understand query opportunities. Yeah. So we want to know if our circumstance is queryable. But before we do that, I want to just show you what you see after you click on the link. So I clicked on the link and I've got a template for a query for heart failure specificity. Yeah, so we have have congestive heart failure. I need to know if I need the query and how I'm going to know. I'll, t I'll show you in a moment how I know, but first let's look at how this is set up. First, you'll need to query the provider that's legally responsible for the patient. So you're gonna say, dear doctor, so-and-so. Next, you are gonna identify right here or refer to where the query um, circumstance is located or where the problem is in the chart, where the discrepancy is in the chart. So if it's in the discharge summary, if it's in the HPI, if it's in the progress note, you'll need to document it right here. Next, clinical indicators. It's these clinical indicators, signs and symptoms, risk factors, treatment, and the diagnostic findings. These clinical indicators will tell you if you need to query. So if you have elements found in this section, then you'll need to query. I'm going to show you in a moment. And then finally, you get to query. So the query begins here. Based on the clinical indicators and your professional judgment, you'll click on this drop down button and your question will populate. You'll select from the options and then here are your options. This is a multiple choice query for heart failure specificity. All right, so I've given you a little tour. Now let's take the documentation and let's put it in this template. All right, so pretty much we are going to place the clinical indicators from the documentation in this template. All right, here we go. We're going to begin with signs and symptoms. So when you click on the drop down button, you'll see a list of signs and symptoms. If you have these signs and symptoms in your documentation and there's no specificity, meaning no type of specific CHF, then you'll need to query. And what do I mean by specific? Well, down below, here are some examples of specific congestive heart failure acute systolic, acute diastolic, acute systolic and diastolic, chronic, acute on chronic, et cetera. All right, so I'm back to the signs and symptoms. So we see this whole list. Now let's go to our documentation. And in our documentation, we have ascites. And you can find that same um, diagnosis or sign and symptom, excuse me, on our drop down button. So we'll click on ascites. We also have dyspnea. Here it is, dyspnea. We also have jugular vein distension. If we go down, we'll find jugular vein distension. We'll click on it. And also, I see some more. I see some signs and symptoms in our objective. We have reduced ejection fracture. All right, so down below it says abnormal ejection fracture. Also, we have BNP. So that laboratory was elevated. How do I know it says it was abnormal? So we're going to click on it. And these are the signs and symptoms in the documentation that's also on our template. And that's an indicator that we should indeed query. Now that we've found our signs and symptoms,
I see in our documentation that we have more signs and symptoms that just were not addressed. No, so they're not addressed on the drop down button so we can write them in. We have severe edema and we also have productive chronic cough of pink frothy mucus. So we're gonna write both of those signs and symptoms in the section where it says, write your indicators. All right, so after we've selected our signs and symptoms, now we have to turn our attention to risk factors. All right, so let's click on the drop down button. If we click on it, we see that there are some risk factors in our documentation. First, we have obesity. Next risk factor is hypertension. And we're gonna click on it, click on it. And here's the final risk factor. A risk factor for congestive heart failure is obstructive sleep apnea. There you go. So we're gonna click all three of these. Now we're gonna scan our documentation to see if there are any additional risk factors Let's see. And do I see any more? I do. I see some more. I see the C reactive proteins. These were labs that, that were carried out. And I also see the lipids. Both were abnormal. I'm going to write it here. So there's not enough space, but you know the idea or the intent. All right. Now that we've gotten all of the risk factors out of the way, let's take a look at the treatment. If you click on the drop down button, you'll see all of the treatment options that you can select from. So I'm going to look in my documentation and see if I can locate any of them. All right, so we have oral angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE inhibitor, aldactone. And that's the very first one. This patient was administered aldactone. We're gonna click on it. Next, I see IV Lasex. Absolutely. So this, these two risk factors I see in my documentation. I'm sorry, it's not a risk factor, it's treatment. These two treatments took place and I'm scanning my documentation to see if there are any more and I see something else. So it's not listed, so I have to write in my treatment right here and that's metoprolol. All right, so that's pretty much it. And then to end off, end things up, I'm going to put in my final, the diagnostic findings, the provider's diagnostic findings, and they are, or it is, congestive heart failure. That, and I'm gonna get it from the assessment right below. And now I'm ready for the query, okay. So your query is right in this section right here. And essentially, you can click on this drop down button and select the query that you want to make. And the one that I suggest um, have selected is based on the clinical indicators in your professional judgment, can this diagnosis be further specified? So can congestive heart failure be further specified? Please complete by selecting one of the options below. Acute systolic, acute diastolic, acute systolic and diastolic, chronic systolic, chronic diastolic, chronic systolic and diastolic, acute on chronic systolic, acute on chronic diastolic, acute on chronic systolic and diastolic, or other Expl explanation of your clinical findings. Click here to enter your text. And finally, the provider can select unable to determine. So 
I say all this to say that this is an example of a compliance query. And most important, this is a wonderful template because it addresses everything you need for a compliant query. The name of the provider, the query opportunity, and where it's documented in the, the documentation, where you can find the query discrepancy, your clinical indicators. I love the clinical indicators because if you click on the drop down button, the signs and symptoms will tell you that, you, yeah, these are reasons for you to query. So if these signs and symptoms are in your documentation, you can go ahead and query. Also risk factors are another clinical indicator and your treatment other, that's your final type of clinical indicator. So make sure that you select all of them from your documentation. If it's not here on the drop down button, go ahead and write in your indicators and your treatment. All right. And finally, the last thing you need to do, just thank the provider and sign it and the provider will respond. And in this day of EHRs, when the provider responds, it will be signed and dated, hopefully. All right, so I just want to shout out the AHIMA Toolkit. It makes your life easy. It definitely helps you develop a compliant query. Definitely. And now if you want to, um, if you're doing inpatient, you use the inpatient compliant query and outpatient, you use the outpatient compliant query toolkit. And you must be a member of AHIMA to use these toolkits. So I want to sum things up. How to query? It must be clear and concise. It must contain clinical indicators from the health record present all present only the facts identifying why the clarification is required, be compliant, and never ever discuss the impact on reimbursement. All right, so I'm just going to ask Miss Virginia to come on board. And before she does, I want to say thank you for, for just engaging and take it away, Miss Virginia. Thank you for watching an exclusive ex presentation in partnership with AAPC. Until next time.